first, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Kenton Festival Box Office. How can I help you? Oh, good morning. I'm coming to Kenton for a few days' holiday next month, and a friend told me there's a festival. She gave me this number to find out about it. That's right. The festival begins on the 16th of May and goes on till the 19th. Oh, that's great. I'll be there from the 15th till the 19th. So, could you tell me the programme, please? Well, on the first day, there's the opening ceremony in the town centre. People start gathering around two o'clock to get a good place to see from, and the events will start at 2.45 and finish about 5.30. OK, thanks. I'll make sure I get there early to get a good spot. The festival will be officially opened by the mayor. He'll just speak for a few minutes, welcoming everyone to the festival. All the town councillors will be there, and, of course, lots of other people. Right. Then there'll be a performance by a band. Most years we have a children's choir, but this year the local army cadets offered to perform, and they're very good. Uh huh. After that, a community group from the town will perform a play they've written themselves. Just a short one. It's about Helen Tungate. I don't know if you've heard of her. I certainly have. She was a scientist years ago. That's right. She was born in Kenton exactly 100 years ago, so we're celebrating her centenary. I'm a biologist, so I've always been interested in her. I didn't realise she came from Kenton. Yes. Well, all that will take place in the afternoon, and later, as the sun sets, there'll be a firework display. You should go to the park to watch, as you'll get the best view from there. And the display takes place on the opposite side of the river. It's always one of the most popular events in the festival. Sounds great. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. And what's happening on the other days? There are several events that go on the whole time. For example, the students of the art college have produced a number of videos, all connected with relationships between children and their grandparents. That sounds interesting. It makes a change from children and parents, doesn't it? <laughs> exactly. Because the art college is in use for classes throughout the festival, the videos are being shown in Hansworth House. How do you spell the name? H-A-N-D-S-W-O-R-T-H. Hansworth House. It's close to the town hall. Right. Now, let me see, what else can I tell you about? Are there any displays of ballet dancing? I'm particularly interested in that, as I do it as a hobby. There isn't any ballet, I'm afraid, but there'll be a demonstration of traditional dances from all round the country. Oh, well, that'd be nice. Where is that being held? It's in the market in the town centre. The outdoor one, not the covered market. 
and it's on at two and five every afternoon of the festival, apart from the first day. Lovely. I'm interested in all kinds of dancing, so I'm sure I'll enjoy that. Hmm, I'm sure you will. And I'd really like to go to some concerts if there are any. Yes, there are several. Three performed by professionals and one by local children. And where is it being held? It's in the library, which is in Park Street, on the eighteenth at six thirty in the evening. I presume I'll need tickets for that. Yes, you can book online, or you can buy them when you arrive in Kenton, either at the festival box office or from any shops displaying our logo in the windows. Well, I think that'll keep me busy for the whole of my stay in Kenton. Thank you so much for all your help. You're welcome. I hope you enjoy your stay. Thank you. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an introductory speech to students at a summer school. You have thirty seconds to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Climb Summer School. Now, I know most of you have travelled a long way to get here, and you're probably looking forward to settling into your rooms. So I promise I won't keep you long. But we've got to get through this very brief induction just to make your stay here as pleasurable as possible. Now, as you can see, while we're located very close to the centre of London, we're actually quite cut off from the main road. And we've got plenty of space for our facilities and students. This was part of our founder's vision, Jasmine Klein, who thought that the best environment for teenage students would be a place that combines the comforts of a big cosmopolitan city with the beauty and serenity of a quiet, remote site. Now, back in 1983, when our school was founded, this all here was an abandoned warehouse. And the classes were held in the main building that you can see over there. There were no trees, no conifers surrounding the property. There wasn't even a main gate. It took years and a great deal of effort to get our school to where it is today. And I'm sure that if you take a look at page thirty-four in your brochures, where you can find a picture of what the school used to look like back then, you'll agree that the changes we've made are more than impressive. But it's not just the facilities that make Climb Summer School special, obviously, and I'm certain you already know this. Over the following ten weeks, you'll receive an assortment of classes on a variety of topics, ranging from language, literature, and poetry to creative writing, communication, and project management. All of these modules have been designed to improve your chances of getting a place in the universities of your choice. While also giving you the opportunity to learn, excel, and of course also socialise with people from all over the world, I can tell you, just among the thirty of you, we've got about twenty-one different nationalities. So what happens now? First of all, I'll be handing out a map of the premises for you to have a look at and explaining where everything is. Once we're done here. You'll all be taken to your rooms where you can unpack and relax for a couple of hours, and later on we'll be having our first activity of the day—a mix and match lunch in the main hall, where you'll have the chance to meet your new classmates. 
Later on in the afternoon, we'll be handing out your first project assignments and splitting you into teams. And tonight we'll be having our very first film night, starting with an early 20th century special. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 15 to 20. So, let's get on with a map. You've already got a version of it in your brochures, so if you can open them to the last page so we can have a look. Very well. As I showed you before, the actual school is right over there in the middle. That's where you'll be having most of your classes. Adjacent to it, you'll find the main hall, which is where we'll be hosting most events, such as today's lunch. On the left from the main building, you'll find a smaller building which is where the accommodation and welfare offices are located. This is labelled as the garden office at the front, and it's easy to spot because it has a green door. Each of you is assigned to a different residence hall. We've got three residence halls in total, one on the left and two on the right. The one right next to the garden office is Ursula Hall, named after our founder's sister, while the other two are Peter Hall and William Hall. Now, as you can see, there are three more buildings to the left of the semicircle here, and one more building on the right-hand side, next to William Hall. So that one, which is shaped a bit like a dome, is the pavilion. This is where all your letters will be delivered, and in the basement floor you'll also find a laundrette. Please make sure you've got plenty of one-pound coins, as you'll need one for the washing machine and another for the dryer. And that row of buildings on the left... The one closest to us here at the gate is the canteen, where you'll be able to buy snacks as well as breakfast, lunch and dinner on days when we don't have an event with food provided. The next one is the gym, which is open from 7am to 8pm from Monday to Friday and until 10pm at the weekend. And the last building, right over there, is the study centre, where you'll find plenty of computers and books as well as a great selection of DVDs and magazines that you can borrow with only a small refundable deposit of £5. Now, please remember to keep your student card with you at all times as you'll need it to access most of these facilities. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students discussing a science project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Hi, Julia. Hi, Bob. Thought about the science project yet? Which one? The presentations are scheduled for next month. The experiments that you and I are working on to demonstrate density, buoyancy and the compression of gases. That'll be complicated. Well, it's not supposed to be. It'll be part of the Making Science Simple series that's being showcased next year and we have to be ready to demonstrate by the end of next week. Oh, well, simple, you say? Yes, not just the concept, but the materials too. 
we have to use cheap, readily available common items. Expensive lab equipment is out of the question. I remember something about using recycled or throwaway items if possible. Anything portable that we can bring into the lab. That's right. Well, any ideas for the project? What about the classic Cartesian diver? Is that the same as a Cartesian devil? The invention named after the famous French physicist Rene Descartes. Yes, a long time ago, superstitious people labelled it that because they couldn't comprehend the scientific principles it demonstrated. They thought it was black magic. How shall we do it? By keeping it as simple, transparent, and economical as possible. So, to start with, open your pencil case and let's have a look. Hmm, you haven't got any. Any what? Paper clips. Oh, there are lots of them in the bottom of my bag. They slip off my papers and collect in the bottom. Look, here's half a dozen. But they're all big metal ones. I want little ones, small vinyl-covered, multicolored ones. Oh, I've got one or two of them too. Great, and if we look around, especially on the floor, we're bound to find a few more. See here. What else do we need? A small rubber band. Well, I've got one of those in my pocket. No, not that kind. Let's go and ask Tara. Why? Those really small coloured bands for making ponytails are ideal. Hey, Tara. Yes. Have you got any spare rubber bands like the ones you fasten your hair with? Oh, heaps! A whole packet full. Help yourselves. Terrific. So far, it hasn't cost us anything. What now? Let's go and rummage through the recycling bins beside. Joe's Mini Market. What for? We want a two-liter plastic soft drink bottle with lid. Hey, I draw the line at sorting through other people's rubbish, and we're also not likely to find one with a lid. Well, go into the store and buy two liters of soft drink. What flavor? It doesn't matter what kind of drink you get. Just make sure it comes in a clear PET bottle. Where are you going? To the cafeteria behind the resource centre. What for? I'm after some straws. I can get them from the shop when I buy the drink. No, I've seen theirs. They're the waxed paper ones. We need clear plastic, and I know they've got them in the cafeteria. I'll also see if I can get a tall plastic cup from there. Good luck. Meet you back here in five minutes. Maybe longer because. I want to go over to my locker and get a wire coat hanger. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Right. Have we got everything now? I think so. I've got extras of most things, so don't worry if this doesn't work first time. Okay. Assembly. Step one. Take a straw and fold it in two. No, not like that. These plastic ones are quite hard to fold. Try pinching it in the middle. That should make it easier to bend. You may even have to bite it, but not too hard. You want a sharp crease, but you don't want to break it. How's this? Good. Now, second step: wrap a rubber band several times around the ends to hold them together. Then, add weight to the diver. So, this straw is the diver. Yes. See how I'm pulling the outside end of a paperclip out a bit. Now, hook the part I bent out into the rubber band that's holding the straw together. No, not that way. It'll fall off. That's right. Turn it over. 
Now, hook two or three more paper clips on. It's hard to say how many we'll need. The idea is to get the diver to be almost all the way submerged, but not quite. We can put it in this tall cup of water to test it. Hmm. What do you think? Too buoyant? Add another paper clip. I think so. Okay. On to the next step. Have you got the empty bottle? Not quite. What do you mean? Well, it's not quite empty. Pour some into this cup for later. Good. Now fill the bottle with water all the way to the top, and we'll gently lower the diver in. Great. Now put the cap back on. And then, the final step is the demonstration of our experiment. You will see that when I squeeze the bottle, the diver sinks, and when I let it go, the diver rises. When you squeeze, the air bubble trapped in the straw compresses, and the water rushes in, making it heavier, so it sinks. And the reverse happens when you release the bottle. What's the coat hanger for? Oh, that. If our experiment didn't work the first time and our diver stayed on the bottom, we'd have had to fish it out with a piece of wire or a hook of some kind. It's best to be prepared. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on a psychological condition called synesthesia. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Today we're going to look at a fascinating condition that challenges the idea that we all see and experience the world around us in a similar way. For example, what do you see when I mention a day of the week or a month? What colour is the letter A or the number ten? If you often find yourself having more than the normal sense sensations, you too could have a condition known as synesthesia. Synesthesia. Is a harmless but fascinating condition, which is often described by psychologists as the joining of the senses. We normally experience our senses individually, so we see a colour or hear a word, whereas people with synesthesia will find two or more senses being stimulated at the same time by a single stimulus. Some people will see or feel a colour when they hear a sound. Others will experience a taste or smell when another sense is stimulated. This happens automatically. The sensation can't be managed. People often go through life unaware that they have the condition. A common response from individuals who learn for the first time that they have synesthesia is one of surprise to discover that other people don't experience the same thing. It's a normal part of life for them, and they will rarely describe the symptoms negatively. To estimate the numbers of people with synesthesia, one group of researchers sat people in front of a computer and showed them letters and numbers in black. Participants were asked to choose a colour for each character they saw. A small proportion of participants, namely those with synesthesia, consistently described the same characters as having the same colours. On the basis of the results. Researchers were able to predict that synesthesia affects about one percent of the population. This number has been confirmed in other research. 
Synesthesia takes many different forms, but the most common is to see or feel a colour in relation to letters and numbers. It's commonplace for people to identify A with red, B with blue, and so on. Some people will actually see a colour, but in most cases it's a question of feeling or sensing the colour. However, it's just as commonplace to see days, months, letters and numbers spatially, that is, in lines or circles, for example. People might say they see Monday up high, Tuesday just below Monday, Wednesday on the left, Thursday on the right, and so on. This doesn't mean that people with synesthesia always agree on what they sense. Two synesthetes will often argue over the colour of a letter, for example. But patterns emerge if a large enough sample of people are observed, providing clear evidence of this condition despite individual variations. Colour and spatial synesthesia are amongst the most common forms of the condition, but they are by no means the only way people experience it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions. One of the more interesting combinations is word-taste synesthesia. This occurs when words lead the person to experience tastes or certain taste sensations. So a person's name might have the flavour of a particular sweet. Places might be associated with the taste of particular snacks. Taste needs to be seen in a wider context here. The sensation may be a feeling on the tip of the tongue or at the back of the throat, and will differ from person to person. Some researchers believe we are all born with the condition, and that it's most prevalent in our early years, but it then tends to become less noticeable as we enter childhood. It's a fascinating thought that as infants we experience the world around us through our senses in a different way than as adults. However, testing this hypothesis will be challenging, bearing in mind the difficulty of getting feedback from young infants. Research also points to the fact that synesthesia runs in families. In fact, as many as 40% of synesthetes, as they are called, know of someone in the family with a similar condition. This won't necessarily be a close family member, and the condition may be traceable back to previous generations, or to an extended family member such as a cousin or uncle. There is evidence that synesthetes are often creative and will often have artistic hobbies or interests. Researchers think this is not necessarily because synesthesia makes them naturally more talented in this area, but the fact that they have multiple sensory experiences generates an interest in, for example, art or music. So that's synesthesia. Apart from its intrinsic interest, for psychologists, it's a fascinating indication that we may all experience the world around us in different ways. Once upon a time, these findings would have been regarded as highly subjective, lacking evidence, and not of any scientific worth. However, we now have a much greater interest in how the brain helps us make sense of the world, and the study of synesthesia is one way for us to discover more about this. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.